well share the message with us this morning. So let's, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. I thank you so much for the blessings that you have given us. Thank you for our brother here that is willing to share a message from you. Would you give him clear thoughts, clear direction? Give him power to share your word. And Father, would your spirit just move on among us and open our hearts and minds? Father, show us the needs in our own life that we can be fed this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. I'd like to say good morning to each one here this morning. It's good to be back in Florida with family. We've had an enjoyable week this week um, with our family gatherings and around Thanksgiving, and uh, it's good to be here. I appreciated the service as well this morning, and the thoughts that were shared in the devotional and the Sunday school, it's definitely a challenge as we look at the life of David, and and uh, even though he had some faults, yet it always amazes me how that God said that he was a man after his own heart, and there is forgiveness even for sin, and we're thankful for that. And we can be a child of his. The, I did think about bringing a message on Thanksgiving. However, I, I chose to go a little different way this morning. You can open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 16. We have here a Psalm of David. And it was a, I, I came across this Psalm here not so long ago. And I was impressed with one verse here in this, in this psalm. We're going to read the whole psalms. But we're going to focus a lot on the, on the last verse. Psalm 16, verse 1 says, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent, in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another god. They, their drink offerings of blood will, will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. As I mentioned, this is a psalm of David. And, and it, it, it struck me this morning, or it struck me as I read this verse here a while ago, of this last verse, Thou wilt show me the path of life. David here, I believe, realized his, his, his dependence upon God. He realized, that he, he realized that his trust in God was able to show him the way to go. And how could he have that confidence in verses 5 through 8? I believe it, it speaks of the first place that God had in the life of David for throughout, throughout his life. And what are some things that David is saying here in, in verse 11? What are some things that he is, he, is, he is speaking of? I think one is, is, that, is the assurance that there is life in God, that God will show him. Second thing is, is that he realized his dependence upon God for life. And the third thing, very similar, is that he realized there was a need in his life for life. And that, and that he realized that true life was not in, of him, in himself alone. And <clears throat> I realized that while this, he, this, may be, have, this may have been a prophecy of Christ's coming, 
and Christ bringing salvation? <clears throat> I believe it was. But, but I'd like to make this practical this morning. There are many times in life that we face situations where we need to, we cry out and we wonder what is the right way? What is the right way to take? What is the path of life that God wants for me? And I suppose different times in life bring different, different challenges. And maybe young, young people, you face that as a young person. You wonder, what does God have for me in life? The common question probably is, is sooner or later, in, as, as, a, as a young person, you wonder, does God have marriage for me? Does God want me to get married? And maybe you, want, maybe you wonder, does God want me to teach school, or does God want me to go to mission field, or does God want me just to stay home? What does God want for me? What is the path of life that I am called to go through? And I'd like to, first of all, look at what Jesus says about life. Because... I believe the words of Jesus have, have instructions for every person across the globe. Every Christian is called to the same thing. But I want to look at this as a foundation for which we can find our individual paths of life that all build upon this foundation. Let's first of all look at John 14 verse 6. Jesus is speaking here. Jesus is speaking to Thomas. Verse 6 says, And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, let's turn to Luke 9. We, hear, we have the words of Jesus again in Luke 9. Verses 23 through 27. Verse 23 of Luke 9 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. I believe here we have a call for every Christian across the globe. Whoever names the name of Christ, we can have these four, four requirements. How is life found? It's found through repentance. It's, th it's found through self-denial. It's found through bearing our cross. And it's found through discipleship. That is the basics of, of Christian living. But we realize these Christian, this, this path of life is a life that, that includes all four of these. It's a, it's a, it's a path that includes all four of these. And, and all, all of these are so hard to do, isn't it, on our, on our own strength. But like I said, there are areas where, where we are called to as individuals. But I believe wherever we're called to, that our lives are to, to portray these four areas of, of repentance, self-denial, cross-bearing, and discipleship, regardless of where God calls us in, in life. And we can, we can see that in Ephesians 4. God, it talks about the gifts of the church. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, it says, Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. We are called to be... A separated people. We're called to live a life of, of self-denial, cross-bearing, and of, of discipleship, of obedience to what God has for us. Now, to make this, to bring it more practical, I have four areas I like to think about in a practical way, and it's it's my it's personal responsibility in finding the will, the finding this path of life, methods of God's leading, truths about 
God's leading and, and the blessings of being led by God. Back in Psalm 16, we see that David put his trust in God. And, and I believe that trust in God brought much stability to his life. And although we know that he failed, we looked at that in his Sunday school lesson this morning, one of his sins, yet I believe that, that, that the secret to David's success was because he, he realized his sin and he was willing to acknowledge it and he repented. And God was able to use him in a tremendous way. In Psalms 25, verse 5, it says, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Psalms 143, verse 10 says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. I believe one of the personal requirements of, of finding the will of God for us is simply that we desire to be led by him. And that we make that choice personally, that, that the will of God is going to be my, my will. And I'd like to look at a couple of Old Testament accounts that <clears throat> probably have stood out to all of us about choices that, that they made that were, that were, that were instrumental in their, in their success as, as a person that God could use. The first one I'd like to look at is in, in Ruth. <clears throat> We know this account very well, but in Ruth, Ruth 1, I'd like to read a couple, a couple uh, first verses in, Luke, uh, in Ruth 1. <clears throat> Ruth 1, verse 4. We know the story of Ruth. We know that her father-in-law, Elimelech, had had taught had brought his his family down to the land of Moab because of the famine that was in Israel and in verse 4 it says and they took them wives which is which would be the the children of Elimelech and they took them wives of the women of Moab the name of the one was Orpah and the other and the name of the other Ruth and they dwelt there about 10 years now down in verse 14 here it, it jumps ahead, jumps ahead over 10 years in, up in verse 14. And, it's, and this is the account of when, when uh, Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws were on the way back to the land of Israel. And, and Naomi had just given, had just told her daughter-in-laws that they were to return back to their homeland and to their, their families. Verse 14 says, And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And, he, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where there die... Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. The decision that Ruth made that day on this dusty road with her mother-in-law was a decision that put her on a course of life that changed her life and changed much for her. And I doubt that day when she made that choice to follow her mother-in-law that she would that she would really had in mind and re and realize the far-reaching consequences of that decision. When she chose to follow her, her mother-in-law back to the the land of Israel. And and to and I doubt she realized that her decision that day would include being in the lineage of Jesus. And and I'm sure she didn't, but her decision had far-reaching consequences. And I often wondered, what was it that Ruth saw in her mother-in-law that, that drove her to make this, this far-reaching decision, the decision that would include the forsaking of all her family, forsaking of all that she knew, and, and, and leave and to go 
and to be with her mother-in-law in the land of Israel. I don't, we don't know. But, but one thing we do know is that, that God blessed that decision. And God was able to use Ruth in a very mighty way in, in, throughout, throughout Scripture. The other example I'd like to look is at the example of Joseph. In Genesis 45... Genesis 45, I'd like to read verses 3 through 8. Here we have the account of Joseph when he was, um, he had his brothers in front of him and he was revealing himself to his brothers. In verse 3 it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the, in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save you that sent me hither but God. And he hath made me a father to the Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. The point I'd like to make here is that accepting things that happen to us as the will of God. There's some things outside of our control as we, as we live lives that happen to us that we can only, only come to one conclusion is to accept them, that, that it's the will of God. And here was Joseph probably the most, the, the most striking example of, of forgiveness and of acceptance of what happened to him. We realize the sin and the awfulness of selling, that the bro his brothers did, of selling him into the land of Egypt. And, and, the, and the fact that, that they, were, they were willing to do that to, their, to his, their own brother. But the thing that stands out to me is the fact that Joseph realized early in life that it was important to accept, the, accept things he couldn't control and to forgive. And I, I'm sure J Joseph did that at a, at a young age because how else could have God used him in such a mighty way when he was falsely accused and when he was in prison when he was, when it was, when he was innocent. But the, the verse here in verse 8 is, always stood out to me. So it was not, not you that sent me hither but God. It was them that sold him, but he realized that God had a plan for him that went far beyond what any of them could understand when these things took place. And so he was willing, he, it speaks of acceptance. It speaks of being faithful where he was, he was called. And I believe he was, it was through forgiveness and acceptance that he found, found God close and he was willing to to embrace his call in life. Third is submission, and our greatest example of that is Jesus. In Luke 22, verse 42, it says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The, 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 the perfect example of Christ, being willing to give his life for us. Now, how does God use, what are some methods God uses to show us his will? And it was already brought out this morning in our Sunday school class, some of these. But I'd like to look at Psalms 1 for the first point under, under this. And Psalms 1, the first three verses. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. God uses his word. 
that's a very basic point, and we, we under, I think I'm talking to a group of people that understand that. But, but verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Is the word of God our delight? Do we find time to read our Bibles? Do we take time? Do we have the self-discipline to have our daily Bible reading? I don't think God will show his will, the path of life, to someone who doesn't have any interest in reading his word. We must know what the Bible says if we are going to find the will of God. It's, it's a very basic point, but it's so true. And somehow, at least for myself, sometimes it's so hard to do, to find the time to, to, to read the word of God and to study it like I should. And, and or are there other things that take our attention in our reading and our, and our time? And are there other books that may be good, but they're not the word of God? Do they take our time? Or whatever it might be. I'm not for reading books, but do they take away from reading the word of God? And it's a challenge to myself, and I let that as a challenge to, to you. John 5, verse 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. I'd like to go to James 1. James 1, verses 21 through 25. says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For, behold, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. You know, not only do we need to know the word of God, but we need to obey what we know. And I believe that's so important. You know, we can study the word of God, we can hear the word of God, but if it doesn't bring about a change in our life, if it doesn't bring about obedience, does it really do what it's intended? What, what, does it really bring about what it was intended to do? And I, I question if it does. You know, in, as I think about this path of life, you know, very seldom is the will of God given to us in a lump sum. You know, very seldom does the will of God, is, very seldom is it shown to us what we should do through the rest, for the rest of life. But it's many times the path of life is one step at a time. And as we think about a path, we think about walking, we think about traveling, and, and I think the path of life, when God leads us in that path of life, it's one step at a time. It's a being obedient to what we know and, and being willing to, to do what he asks of us. And in saying that sometimes, to find the, the path of life, sometimes it's simply called to wait. And in Isaiah 40, verse 31, it's a very familiar verse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. The examples that we looked at in Ruth and, Ruth and Joseph, I believe they took one day at a time and were obedient and were faithful in what God called them to do each day. And God was able to use them to, to accomplish much. And I realize that not everyone's called to the same thing, but the important thing is to be faithful where, where we are. Second method that I have is that what God speaks through us is, is often is through the church. If we're part of a faithful church, I believe God uses that many times to, to help us to understand the path of life. And... We can, read the, we can read verses in Hebrews 13, of, I don't know if we'll turn to them, but in verses 7 and 17 where it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and, and submit yourselves and so on. 
you know, each one of us here this morning, regardless of what our calling is this morning, we are all under authority. And we all need to submit ourselves. And I think it's important that we, we realize that. And, and I think it's important. I remember one time in my life where I was facing a decision of what to do. And, and the, I was asked to go somewhere. And I was really contemplating saying no. I, was, I really thought that's probably what I would say. But someone told me, he said, you know, when the church asks you to serve, you should take that very seriously. And it's not always that it's a yes, but it's not taken lightly. And I think that's so important. And it always, always stuck with me. And uh, needless, I said yes eventually, and I was glad I did. But, but I think it's important that we re remember that third way that God often shows us his, the path of life is simply through other individuals. You know, we relate to each other, and in Galatians 2, verse 11, Paul was talking here. It says, but when Peter has come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to blame. You know, Paul realized that there was a need in Peter's life, that he, he just wasn't quite accurate in what he was teaching. And God used Paul, I think, to to help Peter to understand what what the truth was. And I believe sometimes God uses others and God uses other people to to lead us if we are open to that. What are some truths about God's leading? I'd like to look at John 14. Again, we have the words of Jesus here. I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest 